Thank you. Hey guys. So this talk is about finding zero days of vulnerabilities in embedded system using uh, coverage guided fuzzing. Of course, we have two speakers here. And uh, okay, my name is Queen. Uh, I'm working in um, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and um, my research area is mostly focused on low-level system like OS, or virtual machine, or binary analysis. And uh, I happen to be the founder and the maintainer of a uh, few reversing frameworks like Capstone Disassembler, Unicorn Emulator, and uh, Keystone Assembler. All right. Uh, my name is Kai Jun. Uh, we have been working together for many years, and I guess this is the first time we are actually on the stage together, presenting our work together. So, yeah, that's that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm working for uh, JD.com, an uh, e-commerce company. So uh, we design, and me and my friend, we design quite a fair bit of our badges for security conference. So that is uh, part of it, mainly for uh, Hack in the Box. And I am from uh, Hack in the Box, so I'm the crew. Uh, our next conference for this year, that will be in uh, Beijing on uh, early November, and uh, the late November, we will have one round in uh, Dubai. All right, uh, unfortunately, the CFP is closed, so nothing much I can help over here. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, some of the uh, conferences, some of the uh, uh, things that I've uh, done before. So that is uh, basically what about me. All right, so uh, pass it back to uh, Quinn. Okay, so here's our talk. First, we introduce a little bit on the background on coverage guided fuzzing and how does it work for embedded system. And then we, have, I can, we can show you a few problems we, if you want to introduce smart fuzzer running on, on embedded system. So we show each of these problems. We need to emulate firmware, we need to build our own uh, DBI for instrumentation, and then we go on to build our own fuzzer running on embedded system. And there's some demo. Okay, so first part about fuzzing. The idea is very simple. Fuzzing is got a technique for you to automate, it, automate uh, super testing to five bucks. So, so diagram you can see the, on the screen. We we we, we run the fuzzer by feed the graph input data to the program that we want to test. It's an archive loop, and when the program is running, we monitor it to see if there's any uh, errors like crash or hang or memory leaking. And if we focus on more on uh, exploitable bugs like memory corruption or information leaking, we can find vulnerabilities. So one of the most important things for all the father is that they need to generate the root input. So when the program runs on that input, it can exercise as many code as possible. So on the other hand, uh, all the father need to maximize code coverage to five bucks. So essentially, there are three kinds of fuzzers. First one is black block fuzzing. This kind of fuzzer is pretty uh, simple. So the idea is that we randomly fit the input to the program that we want to test without knowing what's going on in the program. So we don't know what's going on. Just fit a random input, and hopefully you get some crash. So of course, this kind of fuzzing, the black box fuzzing, is very uh, simple, easy to build, but it's kind of dumb and cannot find bugs that stay deep inside the program. So the next type of fuzzer is white box fuzzer. So this kind of fuzzer, we use many heavy way, complicated techniques to analyze the program before we, we test it. And because we know very well how the program is structured, we can generate a better input. So why box fuzzing is nice in a theory? It can find bugs, but in reality, um, analysis on a static program is not easy. It's too complicated. So uh, eventually, if white box fuzzing is too heavy to run. It's too slow. So come to the next one. The last one is a gray box fuzzing, or, or we, we also call it coverage guided fuzzing. So the idea is very simple. So when we run the program that we want to test, we do not run it as is, but we instrument the program. So when the program is, is instrumented and we run that on the input, the instrumentation tells us what's going on, the progress of the program. And based on the progress of the program, we can generate a better input. So we can see that uh, uh, 
covering the further gap somewhere in between white box and white box. It's much smarter than white box because it knows what's going on. But on the other hand, we do not rely on very heavy and complicated techniques for an, uh, binary analysis. So, uh, where the fuzzer proved to be very effective and it found a lot of bugs in the last few years, it's easier to use, easier to set up, and really find a lot of bugs. And one of them is, uh, one of the uh, fuzzer of this type is uh, American Fuzzy Loop, or AFL. AFL. And AFL, in the last few years, found a lot of bugs. So the idea is that AFL follow exactly this diagram. So you need to instrument program so AFL can find the bugs. But the idea is that AFL rely mostly on program with a source code. So to test and to find bugs in program, you need the program with a source code first, which open source first. And then AFL use its own compiler to so when when you use the AFL compatible compiler to compile this program, this compiler automatically introduce instrumentation into the program. So at the output, you have the binary that's already instrumented. Okay, so that's the idea behind the coverage guided factor. But the thing is that guided factor was introduced for very powerful PC system. So once you have some program with a source code, Usually people use uh, guided fuzzer like AFL and compile this program to run on PC. We don't run this one, we don't test this one or any embedded system like ARM, ARM64, or MIPS, we don't do that. Because the PC, the Intel CPU is much more powerful, so you can, you can run the fuzzer at much faster speed. So it's more pro productive to five bucks. So now the question is that, if you want to bring this technique guided further to embedded system, how we can do that? So turn out that is not very easy and there are many issues. First of all, embedded system has very poor support for introduce, introducing new tools to run on top of that. And embedded system, in many cases, are not open source. We don't have source code. And they have very, very poor support for embedded hardware on the existing guided father. So we, we go to the detail on, on all these issues. First, first issue is that image system is very, it's a very rich system. So uh, on the image system, we do not have built-in shell access. So we cannot access to the shell and log into the system like a like typical on PC, right? And in the image system, they do not give you any development facilities. So you can build the new tools, build the new father. For example, inside the embedded system, the, usually they do not provide user compiler. They do not provide the debuggers or any analysis tools. So that's the first issue. Second issue is that in many embedded systems, you do not have source code. You have binary only. You have firmware and binary only. You have no source code at all. And it turned out to be a big issue because on the existing guided fuzzer, they rely on source code to be available, for example, on AFL. So you need source code, so you can compile source code, source code and instrument the program, so you can do the feedback fuzzer. Uh, to be fair, AFL support um, binary fuzzing using some emulation mode like KIMU. But KIMU uh, mode, when done, uh, on AFL to fast binary is very slow, it's not reliable, it's very limited in capacities. And we also miss you for many, many other tools based on DBI. So the last issue is that uh, most existing fuzzer is built for Intel CPU only. They have very poor support for embedded CPUs like ARM, ARM64, or MIPS, or PowerPC. So for example, uh, you want to fast a binary, right? We need to have, we need to use some DBI, some dynamic binary instrumentation framework. And all of them mostly be for x86. For example, we have PIN, right? PIN from Intel. They support mostly Intel CPU only. They have a poor support for ARM, and there's nothing for ARM C4 or MIPS or PowerPC. The other very popular framework is Dynamorio. It's only support Intel. 
and very poor support for ARM and nothing for other CPUs. So we have many problems. You want to introduce a guided fuzzle running on in the system. So how to show each of these problems to build our own fuzzles. So, all right, my turn. Uh, we're going to talk about our firmware emulation and why firmware emulation is... Uh, we do have a very limited resources when it comes to our embedded system, so we need to emulate and then in order for us to put in more tools. So uh, before we start all these uh, uh, things, the first thing we want to talk about is uh, SOC, all right? Uh, we are not, not, not going to talk about MC over here. So uh, we used to have PC during the olden days when then uh, we started to have uh, SOC. So that is where they or the vendor can start to build ARM MIPS, ARM64 devices, all right? Step by step, chip by chip, okay? Just like the bot up there for a better, uh, lesser power consumption, uh, 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 le uh, better performance devices, cheaper, so everything is scaled down from PC including security. So this is what we are starting at, all right? So in order to play with all these things, okay, uh, Quinn started a father and then uh, he tried to run and then uh, I guess he's lacking of a friend that, that can do hardware. That is the reason he comes to me, I, I, I guess. Quinn, is that right? Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the requirement is uh, you need to know quite a fair bit of uh, knowledge on uh, hardware, PCB design, uh, how does the chip run, okay? Of course, uh, GNU commands, and uh, you need to love hardware and not only hardware hacking. That is very important, all right? And I, I, I got questions, all right? So when you're talking about hardware hacking, you're talking about hardware design, it's always something that when you, once you cross over, there are things in the darkness that can keep your heart from feeling the light again. Who knows where does this race come from? Nobody watched Black Hat. Nobody watched Raymond Reddington, obviously, all right? So, okay. So uh, the first thing is uh, we wanted to test our firm, uh, our, our father in a, in a, in an actual firmware situation. So, uh, I brought up a development board, something like this, okay, running on a, a MTK chipset, 7621. It's a very, very powerful chip that can build a very nice uh, Wi-Fi modem. Uh, we tested, we ran, our result is not really promising due to the, the, the MIPS, due to the, the design of the uh, core. So we thought that maybe we can go a bit further. So we got a generic OpenWRT runs and then uh, we tried to build something on top of it. And then we thought that why not we try to get some real firmware and try to run it and try to fuzz it. So this is the thing that we are trying to do. So our idea is very simple. <clears throat> we extract the firmware. It's either from the flash, the website, and the uh, and the uh, or from the uh, APK. Some of the Android's APK, of course, uh, we don't touch those uh, IPA files. Uh, some of the Android APK actually comes with the firmware. Okay, or we try to sniff a traffic, put in a man-in-the-middle proxy. All right, and then uh, we try to extract the firmware. So this is how we get it. All right. So one method is uh, to get the firmware. We either we we extract it. We get it from the APK. We go to the official website, all right, to download the firmware, which is possible for a lot of security cameras, a lot of routers, a lot of IoT devices, okay. Or we need to do some uh, chip off, take out the uh, uh, take out the uh, flash from the device, okay, and then we need to extract it. We need to patch it back. So, or we need to go into a uh, some third-party modding website that actually provides the original firmware. I got no idea how they do it, but apparently they got it. So these are the things that, uh, that we do. So technically, if you want to own the hardware, it's very simple. You download, you patch with a backdoor, and you flash, and then you're gone. So uh, our idea over here is uh, what if we really wanted to get a remote code execution. That is one. And number two is we want to fast and see what is more. And especially, especially from a country that I'm working in, I'm, I'm from Malaysia, but I'm working in China right now. From that particular country, you can have a lot of hardware with some really, really interesting backdoors, okay? Don't quote me. I still want to go back to China and work, all right? <laughs> okay. 
So, previously I told Queen the easier way is a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero can do a very good job on uh, on AMP environment. All right, and uh, if we wanted to test on uh, Arch 64, which is ARM 64, we can use a uh, Raspberry Pi 3. That can give us a very good platform on uh, on on uh, on uh, Arch 64. Okay, MIPS is a bit challenging, but they are tons and tons of development board that and can actually help us to run a different kind of uh, MIPS uh, devices. So how many kind of uh, MIPS uh, 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 devices that we need to purchase before we can test our father? All right. So that is question number one. Okay. For, for me it's very simple. I just order from you know China website and then they will send it to me like yesterday if I order today. So that is what in China. Okay. Uh, Raspberry Pi is rather simple but Along the way, we discovered that if we are using ARM or ARM64 to emulate certain firmware, it's going to give us a lot of uh, 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 issue. One of the issue is uh, the sharing libc is not really compatible with the one that they have due to the different version that they compile, due to different platform that they're running, due to different SDK that they build from different vendor. So that is one of the major issue that we, we are we are facing right now. So. I told Queen, uh, in order to move forward, we need a universal platform. Okay, something that I can work in when I was in China, when I'm still in China, and uh, he can work together when he's back in uh, his own country. So this is the thing that uh, the thing that uh, we wanted. We don't want to ship hardware back and forth just for the testing. So, yep, we try to figure out the way. We wanted to do a, a virtualization so we can test our father to prove that our father is strong enough to prove that our, uh, to prove that our father is fast enough. And the main thing with the father, uh, the main thing with the uh, virtualization is we can add one or two or three or four cores into the virtualized machine together with hypervisor. Okay, we can add more RAMs. Okay, due to the design of the spec of the uh, 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 original SOC, okay, we can add in uh, more space, all right, not the traditional 8 megabytes, 16 or, or 32 megabytes or, or 256 uh, uh, megabytes limitation. So these are the thing because when we tested with uh, especially MIPS or the original hardware, all right, if we try to burn in a firmware, uh, uh, open WRT or whatsoever, the 8 megabyte limitation, the 16 megabyte limitation really give us a lot of issue when we try to put in our tools, we try to put in our, uh, our, our father, we try to add in more libraries, okay? So, uh, and the most important thing over here is we don't have app get inside all these devices. You do have for Raspberry Pi, but you cannot really analyze those kind of uh, uh, old firmware in Raspberry Pi. So we need app get, we need to install all kind of tools. We really don't want to do cross compile with all these, uh, with all these uh, uh, hardware devices. It really killing our time. I mean, we got better things to do in our life, all right? So yeah, uh, by, by, by running on a, on, a, on a virtual machine that actually give us more resources, more flexible resources, more powerful uh, 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 thing and more space to run uh, our code. And the entire objective okay, to run all these uh, commercial devices without source code and uh, in order to allow us to fast, is always we need to get one process running. Okay? Yes, I'm lying. Normally two. But one core process and one supportive uh, process. I will explain why later. So most of the time, when you open up the uh, when you open up the uh, the, uh, the uh, main process, it always spawns uh, the listening services, whichever port that they, they listen. They always compile Apache in there. Uh, not really Apache. They compile the web server in there. They have their 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 telnet in there. They have all the services in there. So. There's always an argument uh, when I talk about this, okay? There are some CTF player when we talk about uh, only need one process running, people always say that you can actually use QEMU static to run it, QEMU static dash arm to run the entire process, but no. QMU static uh, allow you to run run process and you cannot interchange certain information with the sub process, all right? The sub process simply means when 
a vendor design an IoT device, irregardless of whether it's cam, it's Wi-Fi or whatever thing there is, there is one process that handling all the listener, all the demons, all right? And the other process will talk to the hardware, especially if you try to analyze or when we try to fast smart speakers. Right? It's irregardless of whether Amazon or, 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 or those Chinese based speakers, they are one process that talk to the hardware, pass in the configuration, and the main process will start to pick up the information and start the, the listening uh, devices. So if we are using QEMU static, you will not be able to achieve the intercommunication between the two processes. And uh, during our research, okay, we tried to boot up the entire firmware. We, we, we discovered that there is a couple of solutions. Okay? One of them, of course, is uh, this one. Uh, it's called uh, FIRMDYNE. All right? but very, very nicely done. But it's very heavily relied on uh, SCOF, SCOS uh, FS. If you move out from there, you cannot actually do anything and it's very good for dealing uh, 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 virtualization but anything out from that particular field model of modem it, it doesn't prove any help all right and uh, if we search for more we discovered that people used to run it on a very simple way okay uh, 2016 there's one guy actually posted a video on how to do uh, uh, how, how, how to run different kind of uh, 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 arm firmware or, or mid firmware but Due to the requirement and the changes on uh, daily for the internet access or, or, or different uh, hardware that you need to fit into the firmware, it's not easy to run. So once we are able to run out, okay, including hypervisor, which is very, very important, okay, that will make the entire system faster, especially for ARM. Uh, once we fix this part, we discover another thing that we need to fix, uh, which is to run the firmware. All right. Like what I mentioned just now, the libc, the, the different kind of a library is actually very, very hard for you to fit in the entire system. So we thought chroot, it's a very, very easy development. In fact, a lot of uh, ARM exploitation training still rely on uh, chroot to, to, to make sure the demand runs properly. Yes, I, I totally agree that that can be done. Okay, but if you want to attach with some other dos, okay, GDB or whatever thing there is, what? are the tools that can actually help you. I still don't really like the way on uh, running a GDB server and then try to connect it and uh, do all kind of uh, weird stuff over there. So we, I, I, I always wanted a more easier way. All right. So in order to fix uh, this few issue in a, a, a virtualizing environment, I want to run the thing as native as possible without uh, CH root. Okay. I don't want to run in a virtual environment and CH root again, dream within a dream, all right? That is what we wanted to achieve. So we try to run in a native uh, QEMU system, okay, for that particular architecture. The first thing that we bump into is this very weird found, not found issue. We try to run a binary, okay? So we try to run a bin bash inside the system, okay? Uh, we have our virtualized environment. We download the firmware, we unpack the firmware, and then uh, we saw this, uh, this uh, uh, it, it can be bin bash, it, it can be bin sh uh, for, for, for busy box fake bin bash. It's not actually bin bash, it's, it's ash, but they just uh, wanted to call it bin bash. So we, we try to run it and then it says uh, file not file. And we, we, uh, we, we try to troubleshoot uh, for, for quite some time and we discovered that the first library is actually being required. So how do we fix, is, fix this is uh, we do a LD and uh, uh, we, we do a LN, we do a soft link and we get past the first level. Okay. It says found not found. The binary is there, but it's actually the call, uh, the call SO is not there. So that is the first thing that we face. Okay. And we got more library issue. Okay. So the first thing is uh, once we move out from the CH root, we need to soft link all the required library, okay, one by one, or different kind of a busy box command, which uh, you can see from the screenshot is search for one, is search for two, is search for three, four, and uh, all kind of uh, weird busy box uh, uh, settings, okay. So once we soft link all, 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 all the things, okay, then we are moving nearer to the process that we can actually executing. That is number one, okay. And uh, there are some certain issues, they will just give us a sec thought without 
telling us what is missing. So we have issue number one is file not file. We have issue number two which will tell us which file is missing. The third issue is set file. So we need to the easiest thing is uh, always uh, S trace, okay? So uh, we S trace the process and then we discover along the way there is some file missing. We need to again patch it, we need to soft link it before we can get the process running. So that is uh, number two. And then once we finish all this part, we discovered that the interaction with our NVRAM, okay? So uh, anybody knows NVRAM? No. It's a place for you to store, uh, it's a place for you to store your, your configuration inside your, your hardware. So. The, the dark side for the entire NVRAM is uh, it relies on one process. So I, I did mention earlier just now, there's one process that talks to the hardware, talks to NVRAM, and uh, they will pass information to the main process for them to spawn the actual, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, demon listener. So uh, we spend quite a fair bit of time to, uh, to uh, try to craft NVRAM and try to make uh, and uh, try, try, try to try to emulate NVRAM. Uh, obviously, we we fail. We we are not uh, uh, hardworking enough. So the the next thing we know that is uh, we should emulate the process that actually pass the information of the NVRAM into the main process. So we we solve the issue over here. Okay. So uh, sometimes the main process it's not really look for the configuration. If they did not discover the NVRAM, they don't have the configuration, the main binary will self create a set of configuration for the system. So if you are into that, that, that kind of binary congratulation, it's very easy. You can run the binary uh, as and when you want it. Okay? So a uh, fake NVRAM is always uh, how, how can I fake the NVRAM? The communication between the hardware, hardware connector and the main system is always using a UDS, Unix, Unix domain sockets, all right? So write a Python script, doing the, uh, uh, put in the Unix uh, domain socket, return them whatever information that they need into the, into the main uh, binary, you can get the binary running as and when you want it, anytime, okay? So done. And now one of, one of the very weird thing is wireless devices, okay? Smart speakers, uh, 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 routers, wireless cam, okay, they need to run WPA configurations, okay, wireless configuration. So we discovered that uh, we need to virtualize some sort of uh, 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 some sort of uh, wireless devices in there, but I was lazy enough to make ETHO, rename it to WLAN0 and suddenly a lot of devices works inside the emulating environment. So the, the moral of the story over here is that you don't have to emulate or, or try to simulate whatever hardware that, uh, that you have. You just try to fit in the things that they think is good enough for them to run and to spawn the process before you can actually analyze it. Okay? So we talk about uh, library feeding, we talk about, uh, 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 we talk about uh, feeding uh, uh, NVRAM, we talk about uh, wireless devices. If everything else still fail, okay, just patch it. All right, this is your last resort. So there are certain parts that they require all, all kind of weird stuff that you, you cannot fulfill inside QEM, you, you cannot fulfill inside our, uh, our virtualized environment. Patch it and then uh, you will get your way through to run the entire firmware. So once you are able to run the firmware within the virtual, virtualized environment, that is where we can start it to run the uh, dynamic binary instrumentation. So, good. Okay. Okay, so far you can already emulate the firmware. So that means you can introduce new tones inside the firmware, right? To, to run on our virtualization uh, system. So remember that uh, for uh, guided fuzzer to run, we need to instrument the code, right? And remember that we do not have source code. So the question is how to build the guided fuzzer for embedded systems that work for binary only without having any source code. So because we need to instrument the program without source code, so we have to somehow build our, have our own uh, dynamic binary instrumentation. So the uh, idea behind uh, DBI is very simple. DBI is a method for analyzing the binary application at runtime by injecting extra code into the program at runtime. So the, the idea is that 
the actual code is executed as a part of the original code without changing any uh, uh, context of the program. We don't change the behavior of the program. And talking about the DBI, we're talking about the framework. We don't talk about tools, not end user tools, but framework so we can build our own tools on top of DBI. So the idea of the point. Uh, on top we have the original code for Japan, five injection, uh, four injection, injection one, two, three, four. Now we want to instrument our code, uh, this code, so we have we can run our own code after injection one, after injection three, right? So the idea is that we can inject our own extra code into um, the original code after one, after three. So we run when you run that, we run one, and then and then we run our own uh, uh, instrumentation code. And after that, we run two, three, and then we run our own in uh, B, and we run four. So the idea of DPI is very simple like that. But keep in mind that A and B, when we run uh, A and B here, we do not change the original behavior of the program. That's the key point. So there are two main type DPI techniques. The first one is called just in time translation. So the idea is that we do not run the original code, but we translate this code into some uh, other code, and we put the result into a buffer, and we run from the buffer. We do, we do not run uh, directly, we do not really run the original code, but you run the code in the buffer after uh, translating it. So we can uh, perform the translation on the, some intermediate language, like in the case of Van Green, or we can perform um, translation on directly on the native code lines in the case of uh, Dynamo Rio. So you can see that the JIT technique is good because it has very good control on the code under execution. However, uh, this technique is uh, very heavy, it's very complicated and very hard to do it properly. And if you look at the, on the existing debug like PIN or Dynamorio, they are in development for like 10 years or more than that, but they are still incomplete, and they support a very uh, limited number of CPUs, like only Intel only. The reason is this technique is very complicated. The second thing of device called hooking, which is a lightweight, much simpler technique to design and to implement. For this hooking technique, uh, we have less control on the code under execution, and you need to know in advance where to instrument. But it's much easier to, to design and implement. And on this work, we focus on hooking techniques. Uh, talking about hooking techniques, there are two main type uh, mechanism. First one is inline hooking. So the idea is that we put the instrumentation code in line with the original code. So you see that, okay, in this uh, place, we put uh, a and B, our, our, our instrumentation code, right after the original code, right? So and run, is run one and A and two and three and B and four. However, this technique is very complicated because when you directly inline our own code with the original code, we ship all the code behind, around, right? For example, two, we ship it, we ship the position of two, we ship the position of three and four. And some code, when you ship the position, it doesn't work as original anymore. So we do not uh, focus on this technique in our uh, DBI framework. So here's our uh, the technique we choose. Uh, this technique is called a hooking mechanism. It's called D to a hooking mechanism. So the idea is that we do not inline directly our own code behind the instrumentation code, but we cone out. So the idea is that we uh, we patch the original code, so it cone out to our our cone back uh, somewhere else. As a cone back is executed as a instrumentation code when a runtime. Uh, and in many cases, we cannot just cone from the original code to our cone back, but we need to have some help from some executable memory called Champlain memory. It's got a step, stepping stone buffer. So we put the code back into the Champlain buffer and we branch from the original code to the Champlain buffer. So this technique is uh, 
has some limitation compared to, to the inline uh, hooking me mechanism. First of all, we can, this technique do not allow you to hook anywhere. First of all, if the basic block is too small, you override that basic block to control your uh, chamberlain buffer, you can override to the next basic block. So that's some, that's some limitation. However, this thing is very easy to design and implement. So that's why we chose and uh, we went with this technique for our framework. Okay, so the idea is that we branch from the original code to the instrumentation code. So we can either branch to the Champlain or you can branch to directly to the code back. So there are four main techniques for instrumentation. Jump to Champlain or jump to code back or cone to champlain or cone to cone back. So here the first technique, jump to champlain. So on the left side you see the original code, right? And you want to instrument the um, green instruction. So the idea is that we allocate our own buffer named champlain buffer in the middle, and you override the original instruction, the, the green instruction. So when we run there, we save the context because Branching can change the context. And then we jump to the Champlain buffer. So you can see that when uh, this uh, code run, we save the context, we, run, uh, we jump to the Champlain buffer, and we restart the context that was saved before. And again, we need to cone to the cone back, right? The cone back is, is uh, provided by user. So we, before we cone to the cone back, we save the context, and you cone to the cone back. And after we come back to the cone back, we restart the context. And after that, after our instrumentation code is run, we need to execute the original injection, right? But the idea is that we need to move the, origi the original injection. We need to copy the original injection from the original place to our own uh, Chamberlain buffer. However, some injections are very uh, sensitive with the moving, moving, moving like this. For example, on the uh, relative injection, when you move from original place to the new place, it doesn't run anymore. You can break your program. So you need to relocate the original instruction before we copy that into the buffer. So after we execute the original instruction, already uh, relocated, we jump back to the original place. After that, everything is going on as normal. So this is the first thing we jump from the original place to the Champlain buffer. Okay, so the next thing is that we do not jump to the Chamberlain buffer. We do not use any Chamberlain buffer in this, uh, uh, this technique, but we jump directly to the cone back. So you see that we, again, we save the context, and we override the original code with a jump injection. We jump to the cone back. We restore the cone back, uh, restore the context, and execute the relocated injection, and after we do something in the cone back, whatever, and we return. So, you can jump, uh, you can cone to the champlain, you can jump to come back. Uh, no, um, sorry, we jump, you can jump to champlain or jump to come back. So the next technique is called cone champlain because there are many, uh, two, two main type uh, branching, right? Jump or cone, right? To change the direction of the code. So we can use cone to change the direction to the champlain. So this technique is called cone to champlain. So you can see that, again, we save the context. And we cone, we do not jump, we cone to the champlain. So inside the champlain, we restart the context, we save the context before it's a cone to cone back, and we cone to cone back, and we restart the context, right? So we run with the instrumentation, and we execute the original injection, already relocated, and we return to the injection after the cone, and we keep going. So you see that we do not, we do not change in the, any, any context when we, when we run the um, our interpretation code. The last technique is that we do not cone to the champlain, but we cone directly to the cone back, right? So we do not use any champlain in this mechanism. Okay, so the problem with on the existing DBI is that, okay, before we did this, uh, we consider on the existing DBI, and we saw that all of them have some issues that we do not like. For example, on the existing DBI, they have limited support for platforms. So for example, uh, talking about PIN from Intel, right? They support, uh, they work well on Windows, on Linux, but they do not work very well on, uh, on, uh, on Mac, for example. 
Dynamo Rio uh, doesn't work well on Mac. Van Green doesn't work on Windows at all. So none of them work on every platform. The second limitation is that limited on architectures. PIN from Intel only work for Intel. And to some extent for ARM, but doesn't work for ARM, for, for MIS, for PowerPC. So it's the same thing for Dynamo Rio. They only support uh, Intel and ARM, not, uh, not other CPUs. Limited on instrumentation technique. So I introduced um, four main uh, hooking mechanism. mechanism. And uh, on those DBI, they hide all the details inside. They do not expose outside. And they do not support all those uh, hooking me mechanisms. The last uh, limitation is that on those DBI, they are designed for you. So you can easily use that to build your own tools. But they hide many details. So because they hide many, de many, many de details inside the core, you have very limited uh, capacity to optimize your, your the engine of your DBI. OK, so because nothing works for us, we want something uh, better for this specific case. So we design our own uh, DBI framework named Scorpio. So there's some features of Scorpio. First, uh, it's a kind of low-level framework, so you can build your application on top of this framework. And um, the application typically is designed, designed uh, dynamic libraries for example, DRL for Windows or SO for Linux, Dynamic for Max, and at runtime time we inject these dynamic libraries into the target program. Scorpio work cross platform and cross architectures. So we wanted this for uh, in the system, but eventually we invented uh, and designed Scorpio so it worked for own kind uh, operating system. It worked for Windows, for Mac, for Linux, for BSD, for Android, and so on. It support all the popular CPUs. It works for x86, work for ARM, x 4 MIPS, Spark, PowerPC, and a few others. And because we want uh, very flexibilities and maximum uh, optimization, so for your support own cap instrumentation uh, I introduced before. And unlike many other the existing DBI, uh, you can find many existing DBI even open uh, with source code on the internet. But uh, many of them only allow you to uh, instrument the function as an end chip of the function. So unlike that, Scorpio will allow you to instrument any address in the program, any, anywhere. Uh, we design Scorpio to be very easy to use, but support own kind of optimization. So in some special setup, it can be like 100 times faster compared to any other things. So here's the diagram. You can see that uh, we abstract away all the details about the OS, about the architectures, and all the OS, all the architectures come in as a plugin. So we support Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, BSD. We support all kind of CPUs, ARM, C4, ARM, MIPS, Spark, Power CPC, and x uh, Okay, so there's just some details about how uh, we design and implement this. Uh, for example, we need to support cross-platform uh, uh, operating system, right? So talking about memory, we need to support uh, Scorpio so it can provide, you can allocate a champion buffer, it can change the permission from read-write to executable, and uh, after that we can patch code in the memory. So different uh, operating system has different way to allocate memory, to change the permission, or to patch memory. Uh, okay, we need to support all kind of CPU, right? And this is, uh, depends on the CPU. Different CPU has different way to different requirement for you to save memory, to save register, to restore memory, to restore registers. So we have to we have to handle all of that. And not only about CPU, we, we also need to consider the calling convention because each operating system has different ways to call the uh, call back, right? So we need to save the context properly and we restore it properly. And that depends on calling conventions. It's pretty complicated. Okay, I can. Uh, I think I should skip some details. You can look at the slides. 
So here's about how to support uh, cooling um, back on uh, on card uh, CPUs. So different CPUs have different way to cool the back to insert equipment into the uh, to the memory to the stack, for example. Yeah, some CPUs is very uh, like PowerPC has very uh, has got, uh, complicated to support. Uh, to branch from the original instruction to the to the championing buffer. So we had some tricks to support our PC, for example. Scratch is the so because um, many spills like M C D four, MIPS, Spark and Pop PC, they do not allow branch to indirect target in the memory. They only allow to jump to a rest keep inside register, right? So in this case we need to use some scratch register. So we Store the uh, target rest into some scratch register and we jump there. And that depends very much depend on CPU. Uh, one more thing, we need to patch the memory. We need to patch the original instruction. So it overrides original instruction. So we can execute our code back, right? So code patching need to be reflected in the uh, instruction cache. And this also depends on the CPU. Hello. First of all, access it, it doesn't have any instruction cache. It just overrides the uh, original instruction in the memory, and that's it. But for other CPUs, we need to flash the cache. So once you override, flash the cache, and the CPU can recognize a new instruction. Uh, there's something in uh, the implementation part. So first of all, we need to override all the original instruction in the memory. And by doing that, we override one or two instructions, for example. So we need to get the instruction boundary, right? Like one or two. And the amount of instruction to be overwritten depends on the CPU. For example, on acoustic, because the instruction size is not fixed, right? So we need to use some disassembler to determine the instruction boundary. We can override one or two or more. It depends. So for this uh, requirement, I use uh, my own uh, capstone disassembler, so you can extract the injection boundary. The next part to do is that I need to override the injection because you need to relocate injection, right? Once we copy it from the original place to the chimney buffer, so we need to relocate for example on the relative injection. So in this case, we use capstone to detect the injection type. It depends. And after that, we use um, our, our, our other framework, a Keystone Assembler, to override, I mean, to rewrite the, 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 the relocated injection. So it works in the uh, new place in the chimney buffer. So you can see that uh, actually uh, Scopo is on top of two frameworks, um, Capstone Disassembler and Stone uh, uh, Assembler. And because these two frameworks work cross perform and cross architecture, that's why Scopio work on own cap CPUs and own cap uh, operating system. Okay, so some other things about we need to do in uh, Scopio like code analysis, customization. Okay, so as, I, as I said, because um, Scopio is very flexible and allow own cap optimization for you to build a fast and powerful faster. So we provide API for to. So you can do own cap optimization. You can optimize cone bike, optimize the champion. You can optimize a scratch register, how you save store uh, context, and so on. Okay, so now we have our own uh, DBI, and we can use this DBI to instrument the binary of the in the system, right? So what to do with that? We went on to build our own father for embedded system, covering guided guided father. Okay, so the idea is that we do not build our own our own father from scratch, but we build on top of a father which is very powerful and very mature father. So we do not do from scratch, but we build on top of AFL. Uh, but remember that AFL doesn't support close binary very well, so. Our extension on need to uh, support the uh, fuzzing uh, the binary, right? So we use our uh, Scopio DBI to support 
and instrument target binary running inside the father. Uh, just some features we build for our father. We support select binary fuzzing. That means we can focus on fuzzing only only a, a part of the binary, not a whole binary. We support, per, we support persistent mode as well. Uh, and besides that, we can buy our own fuzzer some very advanced techniques, like you can buy that uh, our, our own fuzzer simulate execution, or can buy a static assist, so we, our fuzzer can penetrate deeper into the program and find more, more code. So the design the fuzzer is like this. It's pure super based. We do not rely on any CPU features, right? We use just pure binary, pure super based uh, mechanism. Um, and our fuzzer is cross platform. It works on on the on, on the operating system. This fuzzer work for not only for embedded system, but only for, work for other um, platforms like Windows or Mac or Linux or anything. Uh, it built on um, Scorpio, which is support many CPU. So our fuzzer also support many CPU as well. It's um, as before, mid, power PC, Spark, and all those uh, embedded system. Okay, binary support, of course. And um, we build our fuzzer so it's fast and very stable. It's much faster than other uh, fuzzer you can you can experiment on the in the public now. And it's very stable. stable. Okay, talking a bit about implementation. So we reuse a fuzzer. We do not change the core design of our own. We use the fuzzer itself. And remember that in the design, um, we, if you want to fast the program on the FL, right? We need to compile from source code to introduce instrumentation into the target binary. But because we do not have source code, we only have target binary, right? So we build our own instrumentation using Scorpio, as I uh, explained. So the, own, uh, the instrumentation part is compatible with FL. So we just reuse, uh, reuse FL, we do not change anything. But the instrumentation part is compatible with FL. So that's how we, we can reuse AFL. Um, the point about Scorpio is that we need to tell it where to instrument, right? So we need to, um, to fast a program, we have to perform static analysis for this program before we run the faster. And after static uh, analysis um, um, step, we can locate the program in the program where you can where, where you want to instrument and we pass this information where to instrument to uh, Scorpio so Scorpio can inject the hooks in inside the program when uh, when it runs at runtime. Yeah and at runtime the hook uh, come back instrumented by Scorpio just update in, uh, execution context lies the uh, usual in the typical uh, um, scenarios in uh, AFL. So we adopt the same memory whenever we reach uh, some um, basic block, for example, so AFL knows what's going on. And because we uh, use very lightweight Scorpio uh, DBI, so as a result, our father run at the near native speed very fast. Okay, I lie. We don't have demo, really. But uh, we we do fast one of the uh, favorite uh, Wi-Fi router in uh, in uh, China. I'm not too sure this part of the world whether it's it's that famous or not. And uh, we discovered few interesting thing. Of course, uh, we, we we get a RCE. Okay, we we, we get a, a a buffer flow, and then now uh, we craft some shellcodes and all these things, and then we get a RCE. But one interesting about this vendor, it's. Uh, you have one exploitable bug in the international version, which is quite obvious. And uh, on the China edition of the firmware, they don't have that particular bug, so don't quote what I said. It's not good. And uh, uh, of course, on, 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 their, on their own uh, Chinese uh, version, we do discover some of the bug, which is uh, still exploitable, but it's not as obvious as the uh, international version. So you can see we, we, we actually uh, inject command. We, we turn on the uh, Telnet on uh, port 4444, and uh, we got 
uh, Telnet are being activated inside the system. So this is fast by uh, the uh, the thing that we, are, we have built together. All right. So the conclusion is. We do have uh, certain issues on the closed source software. We still have issues on, uh, on the uh, DBI that are currently uh, uh, available out there. And then uh, Fuzzer is not strong enough, so we built a firm emulation. So we can do a DBI, we can do a, a guided Fuzzer for the uh, entire system. So we solve three issues by using uh, three different tools. Okay, The uh, emulation, the, the, the Scorpio DBI, and then uh, finally the uh, 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 guided Fuzzer for embedded system. All right. so. Uh, Yes, we built a smart fuzzer, not only smart, but uh, one of the fastest of fuzzer in the world, I believe. If somebody wants to challenge me, I will go away from here. Okay, so uh, we emulate firmware. We have a cross uh, platform architecture uh, fuzzer, okay, and, uh, and a DBI. Of course, uh, we support binary only. And uh, yeah, we found quite a fair bit of bug, and the, the one in the uh, Tenda router is uh, one of them. We still have three minutes for questions. <coughs> Yes, we are not releasing it yet, just in case you ask. So, questions. Okay, thanks <laughs> for the talk. Um, yeah, we have one question coming up. Yeah, I have another question. It's not about releasing uh, the <laughs> right. code. Uh, but actually, the static analysis step you mentioned to implement the hooks, is that automated or do you need to do that by hand? Uh, okay, we use some uh, static analysis tool to anal analyze the program. But we still need to do some manual work so we can focus where we want to focus uh, the faster on. For example, we just want to focus on the back side part, right? So we locate the area. And we know from here to here we need to f focus our fuzzing and we instrument those basic blocks. And we, once we know uh, what we need to do, we pass the information to the father so it, it, need, it knows where to instrument the code. The thing is, uh, with uh, with uh, LT devices and an embedded system, it's a fairly huge uh, binary that you're normally looking at. So they have the web servers, they have all kind of weird stuff in there. So it's good to analyze before you ex you need to extract out the part you need to fast. Then only you fast. You don't want to fast the entire four meg, eight meg binary just for you just to fast it. So actually, you can okay if you're lazy or you want to do quick, you just instrument everywhere, right? That's also possible, but you want to be good, productive, quick, and yeah, nice. Faster, you need to do some manual work to analyze the program before that. Anything that is, uh, applies for own car faster, not only this. Thanks. Sure. Right. Any more questions? Okay. okay. Um, so thank you and okay, um, thank you. Thank you. A big round of applause.